Uh, welcome to lecture number 12 in the Renaissance literature. My name is Fauzi Slisli and today we will be talking a, about a tradition of poetry that became known during the Renaissance as the country house poem. The country house poem. Um, it's a, the English country house poem was uh, invented in the early 17th century and it's defined by its praise. It involves a praise for a country house estate and it, it, it's usually male owner. So basically it's a tradition of poetry that has praise for a house or an estate or a mansion in the countryside and usually the male owner of that estate or uh, country house. Um, so country house poetry is a sub-genre uh, of Renaissance poetry it was first written during the 17th century. It was closely linked to patronage poetry. When we talk about patronage, this is as good as it gets. So you have a house in the countryside, beautiful mansion, a little palace, and you have poets that come and write these beautiful poems about your house, about you, and tell you how great you are. And of course, you have to feel obliged to give them some money, to fund them, to uh, invite them to stay in your mansion for three months and write poetry or things like that. So the country house poem tradition was closely linked to patronage poetry in which poets sometimes outrageously flattered patrons in order to gain sponsorship and status. At this time many houses were built in the countryside as a display of wealth. It became fashionable for wealthy people in England to build a house in the countryside as a retreat for the courtier when overwhelmed by the court and city life. So the, the, they go to the countryside for a break, for some vacation and so on. Country houses were not originally just large houses in the countryside in which rich people lived. That's not how they started. Essentially, they were powerhouses, right? The houses of the ruling class. They could work at a local and national level from there as the seat of the landowner. This is where the seat of the landowner, because the wealthy English people were essentially landowners. Until the 19th century, the largest number, the biggest uh, the most powerful and wealthiest people in England were landowners. They weren't traders or, you know, merchants or, or businessmen or so on. They were landowners. So the country house mansion is the seat of the landowner. That's the base of his wealth. Um, and most often he was also, this landowner is also a member of parliament, so he would go to the city, to London, to be a member of the parliament and do his political business, but his powerhouse is back in his countryside residence. Basically, people did not live in country houses unless they either possessed power or by setting up in a country house were making a bid to possess it. So either they had power and they lived in the countryside or they want to get power and they started by having a residence in the countryside. Country house poems generally consistent, consisted of complementary descriptions of the country house uh, and its surrounding area, which often contained pastoral details, details of natural elements surrounding the country house. Country house poems were written to flatter, to flatter and please the owner of the country house. Why did the poets do this? Well, until the 19th century, as I said, the wealth and population of England lay in the country rather than in the towns. The wealth and the power of England until the 19th century was in the countryside, it wasn't in the city. Landowners rather than merchants or businessmen were the dominating class. Even when the economic balance became to change, they were thoroughly in control, meaning the landowners were thoroughly in control of patronage and of legislation, meaning the government. So strong through their inherited patronage and expertise that their political and social supremacy 
continued, and in a way it continues to the present. From the Middle Ages until the 19th century, anyone who made money by any means and was ambitious, he had ambitions for himself and his family, automatically invested in a country estate or a country house. Poets tried to gain the favor and patronage of these landowners through praise of their homes. Um, this is a tradition also that started by Ben Jonson. His country house poem, To the Panthurst, uh, was written to celebrate the Kent in the region of Kent, the estate of Sir Robert Sidney, uh, Viscount Lyle, later Earl of Leicester, uh, father of Mary Roth. So this is a very famous and powerful and wealthy Englishman, um, huge. Uh, power and wealth and huge influence and from a long and big and wealthy family and Ben Johnson wrote um, this famous poet this famous poem to the Panthers for him Sir Robert Sidney praising his country house uh, the poem idealizes country country life and sets up an opposition between the city and the country uh, the title to Panthurst indicates that the poem is a gift in praise of Panthurst, the mansion. Johnson begins by telling us what Panthurst is not. Panthurst is the mansion, so Johnson begins by telling us what Panthurst is not. Um, Thou art not Panthurst built to envious show, nor can boast a row of polished pillars. Thou hast no latherns. So, uh, basically, it, this tells us that Panthurst was not built to show off the wealth of its owner. He's, he's praising his modesty. Um, and Pan, Panthurst is far from ostentatious. Um, the qualities that cannot be found at Panthurst are listed to make it seem humble and down to earth compared to the average country house. Perhaps this is done to prevent peasants' resentment. Uh, hasad, hasad of the poor people, the peasants. So he's, Ben Johnson is perhaps telling them, look, don't be jealous. This isn't too much. He's not, he's modest. He's not spending too much money on this. Um, a more likely explanation, however, is that it is subtle criticism of other more flamboyant residences. He's saying that other residences other people spend a lot of money and build these huge ostentatious country houses this gentleman that Johnson is praising actually doesn't he has a modest and beautiful um, country house that's character characterized by its beauty and its tastes rather than uh, by its spending Johnson seems to take a Christian standpoint and in his encouragement of modesty. Remember we said Johnson liked to encourage moderation and, and values and rules. And this is also, in a way, this is a Christian uh, position from Johnson. He is promoting uh, modesty. And his veiled criticism of the vanity of the owners of more showy places, more showy edifices. Uh, or perhaps it is a frustrated stab at the inequalities of capitalism, you know. Panthurst is said to boast natural attractions. He says that the attractions in Panthurst are not ostentatious, they're natural. He says of, of soil, of air, of wood, of water, therein thou art fair. So its beauty is in its soil, it's in its air, it's in its wood, it's in its water. It's not in the money that's spent in it. That's what Johnson is trying to tell us. The idea that nature is beautiful and does not need decoration is emphasized. The opening lines of the poem may lead the reader into thinking that Panthurst is a dull place, boring. Um, so the employment of classical allusions serves to seize the reader's attention and also adds an air of mystery and uncertainty to the place. This also gives the impression of a pagan society and reinforces mythological stereotypes about the countryside. 
although we are told towards the end of the poem that his children have been taught religion, which means he is a Christian man, that these people are not pagans. It is significant that the poem mentions the poet Philip Sidney, um, who is a descendant of the owner of the house. Philip Sidney is uh, the great English poet. So uh, the poem says, at his great birth, where all the muses met, we are told that Penthurst was the birthplace of Philip Sidney, and this serves to disperse the stereotype that country folk were unintelligent. So he's telling us that this place in the country, these people are well educated and intelligent. The absentee landlord, who, meaning the landlord who's never there, just comes to collect money, the absentee landlord who dissipated his time and fortune in living it up in the city, just, you know, spends his time in the city spending his money, became a stock figure in contemporary satire. But so did the boozy, illiterate hunting squire, the Sir, the Sir Tony Lumpkin or Sir Tom Billy Clumsy, who never left the country at all, or if he did, only made himself ridiculous. So there were stereotypes about people who, you know, owned land in the countryside and, you know, just rented it to people, took the money, and they were never present. They just go to the city and spend their money. But there was also stereotypes about the uh, wealthy people that just live in the countryside. They just drink alcohol and go hunting and they never do anything else. They never go to the city. Philip Sidney was seen as the model of a Renaissance man. He is the, uh, the, the owner of Panthurst, is a descendant of Philip Sidney. And Philip Sidney is a, uh, lived during the Renaissance and was a model of the English Renaissance man. He was a courtier, uh, meaning he spent a lot of time in court, uh, in the king and the queen's court. He was a talented poet, uh, an advisor to the queen, and he was also a soldier. His whole family were patrons of the arts. So the connection made between Panthurst and the Sydney family gives the impression that Panthurst was the epitome of an educated, cultured household and family. In the central part of the poem, Johnson makes Panthurst sound like a countryside utopia. Uh, the the, co the, the corpse never fails to serve the seasoned deer. Each bank doth yield the conies, uh, meaning rabbits. Uh, the painted partridge lies in every field, willing to be killed. Uh, in a way, even, he says, even the animals, they come and run to you, willing to be killed when you go out hunting these rabbits. The rabbits, they just come running to you and wait for you to kill them. So he's drawing an unrealistic, utopic image about Panthurst, this mansion called Panthurst. It is likely that Johnson's portrayal of country life has a satirical edge. Maybe he is being ironic. Maybe he's making a joke. He says that fat aged carps run into thy net, right? These fish, these like big huge fish, carps, they come and run into your net when you are fishing them. And that what, when eels detect a fisherman, they leap into his hand, right? Again, fish, when they see a fisherman, they just run and leap, they jump into the fisherman's hand. This irony may be directed towards those who boast that country life is trouble-free. A um, second example of the country house poem can be seen is in Amelia Lanier's. Uh, she was born in 1569 and died in 1654. Uh, she was of Italian Jewish descent. She may have served in the Duchess of Kent's household. Her volume of poems, Salve Deus Rex Jodurum. Uh, was written in 1611. It was in part a bid for support from a number of prominent women patrons. Her country house poem, The Description of Cookham, this is her famous country house poem that we're going to look at today, 
uh, and this country house poem gives a, an account of the residence of Mar Margaret Clifford, the Countess of Cumberland, in the absence of Lady Clifford, who is depicted as the ideal Renaissance woman, graceful, virtuous, honorable, and beautiful. Right? So this is the lady who owns the house. She's a, she's a, a countess. Right? Um, <clears throat> uh, Lanier describes the house and its surrounding while Lady Margaret is present and while she is absent. So she describes the house while the lady is present and she describes the house while the lady is absent. While Lady Margaret was around, the flowers and trees she says, set forth their beauties then to welcome thee, right? When she comes, the flowers just come out to welcome her. The very hills right humbly did descend, the hills almost descend to welcome her. When you to treat upon them did intend, and as you said, you free, you, you, your, your feet you still did rise, glad that they could receive so rich a prize. It seems as if nature itself, nature itself, is there for the sole purpose of, place, of pleasing Lady Margaret. The birds come to attend her, uh, and the banks, trees, and hills feel honored to receive her. Uh, nature is personified throughout the poem, uh, uh, and when Lady Margaret leaves, uh, nature appears to go through a process of mourning like nature misses the lady and nature is sad when this lady leaves the house and goes back to her residence in the city. Everything retained a sad dismay, he says. When she leaves, everything retained a sad dismay, a, a, a sadness. Many poems emphasize the strength of nature and the weakness of, uh, of nature uh, uh, in in this poem, I mean, many poems emphasize the strength of nature, but in this poem, nature seems to be at the mercy of a human uh, uh, and a woman even. This unrealistic notion of Lady Margaret's control over the elements greatly flatters her. The poet is trying to flatter the lady, impress her, and the poem is therefore likely to gain Lanier's favor with the Countess. A far more rational explanation would be that Lady Margaret resided at Cookham during the summer months, right, when nature is beautiful and the flowers are out and everything is nice, and just after, after the summer she left when autumn came upon, and winter and autumn came upon the countryside. In order to flatter Lady Margaret, uh, the poet Lanier implies that the countryside is mourning her departure, but in actual fact she sees the turn of the seasons, which is not affected by Lady Margaret. Just as in uh, to Penthurst, Johnson's poem, the lifestyle seemed too good to be true. It's like utopic and unreal. Uh, in a description of Cookham, the lady of the house seems to be too close to perfection to be real. Uh, perhaps Lanier's poem is a satirical take. Maybe Lanier is being satirical and ironic um, on the relationship between the poet and the patron, right? She appears to be saying that poets will write anything to please their patrons. In a way, she might be trying to say this indirectly, that look at us, we the poets. We even write silly unrealistic imaginary things just to get money from these rich people. Um, she appears to be saying that poets will write anything to flatter patrons in order to gain their favor, even something as ridiculous as the idea that nature is emotionally sensitive to the needs of these rich people. The grass did weep for woe, right? The grass weeps for you and mourns the, de the departure of a human being. Um, more or less, to round this up, basically the social criticism contained in these two poems is subtle, 
There is social criticism of the habits and the mores of the English society, but it's subtle, it's not open. Um, and it's covered, shrouded in praise and flattery. Society is never criticized directly by the poet, and irony uh, and satire was their most valuable tool. Nature behaves in strange, abnormal ways in both of the poems, in Johnson's to Panthurst, Animals seem unrealistically submissive towards the wills of the people. Provisions are acquired with the minimum of effort, like it's heaven, for example, and honey and milk just appear from, you know, nowhere. The timber crisis of the 17th century illustrates the extent to which poets grappled with contradictory images of nature. Nature, on the one hand, is the fallen post-lapsarian -laps realm of scarcity and labor, and on the other hand, it is the divinely ordered handiwork of a beneficent God that can be made to yield infinite profit. So there was a, a uh, crisis in uh, timber in the 17th century. There was a, uh, a lack of timber. It's the wood that you build houses and stuff from. And nature became a symbol of both luck and of plenty. It's a luck because there is a crisis, but it's plenty because it's a testimony to God's infinite power to, you know, produce and create uh, trees and forests and so on. The social criticism present in to Panthers is very effective because it is unexpected. You don't expect it. This is a poet who's coming to praise a rich man. You don't expect social criticism there. But it comes out in between the lines. If you pay attention, if you read carefully, you see criticism of the society, criticism of these rich, rich people, and criticism of the poets themselves for doing all this for money. The role of country house poems was to praise and flatter, yet it is possible to detect a strong sense of irony in the description. And we see the criticism present if, you, if we read between the lines. Similarly, love poetry is sometimes used as a way for poets to discuss other things. So the main uh, topic of the poem might be love, right? But it's just a way to talk about other things. The poem, for example, who so lists to hound I know where in an, in, in, is, where is an ha a hand, written by Sir Thomas Wyatt. It first appears to be a love poem, but it could also be interpreted as criticism of patronage, hunting and politics. The hunter and the hunted are compared to the patron and the poet. At this time, poets were afraid to be direct in their criticism of the world they lived in. They were too afraid to be directly critical of the world, so they disguised their criticism and their love stories or love poems or, or, or uh, praise uh, and so on, because they could incur the wrath, the anger of the monarch, the king, or the authorities, or the rich people, which was never beneficial if the poet wanted to gain patronage. The poems are effective as social criticism because the criticism is not obvious, it's not clear, but if one looks closely, it becomes apparent. However, more likely, it was unlikely that people read country house poetry to be provided with political and social insight. Most likely, People in the Renaissance didn't go to read country house poems to get their criticism of politics and society and stuff. Um, <clears throat> so it is likely that many of the allusions in the poet and the associations and the metaphors were lost on the majority of the readers. And with this brings us to the end of this session on the Cavalier's poet. I hope you find it useful and till our next session. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وتعالى وبركاته